So the Second Punic War is over. The Battle of Zama. And was defeated. Carp is defeated. Now let's see what happens over the next 50 years. 50 or so years. To a 1 BC to approximately 150 BC. So we're going to learn about the events of these years. You understand why Rome provoked Carthage. You understand what I mean by that towards the end of the lesson. By doing that, we are hopefully developing our historical thinking skills. Key words, talent. In the ancient world, a talent is a sum of money, a, a gold coin or such and such. A talent doesn't mean talent the way it means today. Talent is a unit of currency. Indemnity. Something you owe somebody is a punishment. An indemnity. You owe them this money, you owe them this service. You are, you're indemnified towards them. You owe it to them. Subordinate, if you're below somebody, you are their subordinate because of what they say. Cripple, Massinissa, you know here, the Prince of Numidia. Fled, if you have to leave somewhere uh, under duress, you have fled. Exile, suicide, resurgence, coming back, getting stronger again. So, Zama is over, Rome has won. Scipio knows he can't, he's, the army is simply not big enough for a long siege of Carthage. Anyway, his need to do that, Carthaginians are willing to make peace. So they negotiate a peace treaty with him. It has to be ratified by the Senate back in Rome. So the Senate have agreed they will, they will abide whatever Scipio decides. Scipio decides to end the war. Hannibal, so Carthage, must withdraw to just the area around the city of Carthage itself. No empire. Just a rump of land around Carthage. They agree to be subordinate to Rome in foreign affairs, meaning they can't make war on anybody without asking Rome to mission first. No navy. No navy. Not allowed a navy. They have to pay Rome 10,000 silver talents over a 50 year period. 10,000 silver talents equates to hundreds of billions of pounds in today's money. They're looking to cripple Carthage. No navy, no empire. And constantly paying loads of money every year over to Rome. So the idea here is for the Romans to keep Carthage weak. As part of this peace treaty, Massinissa becomes the ruler of Numidia. And over the next war, 30, 40, 50 years, he expands Numidia. He takes these cities here. And every time he takes one, Carthage has to ask Rome to mission to fight back. And Rome always says, no, you can't. Rome always sends senators over. And they have a think about it and decide, you know what, Massinissa can have that city. He can have that land. So this purple bit here slowly shrinks because Rome keeps on siding with the Ali Massinissa. Partly because they're still afraid of um, Carthage and want to keep on punching them. Hannibal. So after 202, after Zama, he sort of retires. He stays head of the army, he stays around. But by about 196, a big crisis erupts. Carthage can't pay its indemnity that year. But Hannibal realises there's plenty of cash. So the people who run Carthage are so corrupt, they're pinching it. So he gets himself elected suffet, which is like a consul in Rome. And he gets to rule Carthage for a year. And in that year, he arrests corrupt officials, he gathers the money, and they end up easily paying off Rome. And Hannibal actually starts Carthage's commercial and economic resurgence. However, by doing that, by um, persecuting rich and powerful people, he's made enemies. And his enemies in Carthage tell the Romans he's plotting to join up with the Eastern empires, uh, the Seleucids, uh, these are successors to Alexander the Great, to try and attack Rome again. So the Romans send some scientists to investigate. Hannibal realises what's going on. He realises they're setting him up to arrest him, drag him back to Rome and execute him. So in 195 BC, Hannibal flees Carthage and never sees it again. He goes east. He joins up as a general, as a military advisor to several 
Eastern kings, none of this really comes from anything. The Romans continue to pursue him, and finally he's cornered in a house in Turkey, which is actually Turkey, and in 183 BC, to avoid being captured, taken back to Rome and strangled in public, he commits suicide. The other big story about this sort of 50 year period is that Carthage actually does start to economically recover. And it seems to be, the reason appears to be, Carthaginians are unbelievable agriculturists, farmers. They turn the area of North Africa, which is like virtually desert, into the most fantastically lush and productive farmland. With this, they're able to actually quite easily pay off their indemnity to Rome. At one point, they even offered to pay it all off early. The Romans say, no thanks, we want to remind you how much you owe us. We don't want you to pay it off early. But the point is, Carthage is recovering. And by 150 BC, they've paid off everything they owe the Romans. And it appears to be this that sets the Romans off into deciding this can't stand. This charmer here, is called Cato, Cato the Elder, he's a Roman citizen and a bitter enemy of Carthage. He's the chap who every time he has a speech in a Senate ends it with Cartago delenda est, Carthage must be destroyed. He spends the last years of his life vociferously arguing that Carthage is too dangerous, too powerful, and must be destroyed. It's Rome's enemy, they must destroy it. And by around about 150 BC, it looks like the Romans are going to accept his advice and figure out a way to provoke Carthage in starting the war to then go and destroy them once and for all. 